When I was a kid and I got sick, my mom would call Dr. Stein. He would show up at the front door about 20 minutes later with, and I swear this is true, an actual black bag. These days, this is the only medical advice coming into my house. People think I'm insane, so when I get on an airplane, when I get to my seat, I spray this all over my seat <laughs> and under my tongue. Um, because the research says that colloidal silver really keeps viruses away. Well, since Dr. Stein isn't around anymore to make house calls, and this advice is free and convenient, should I listen to it? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology and devote one show a month to critical thinking, skeptic check. In this episode, do we still need doctors? The public realm is filled with compelling health tips from people without medical degrees, and self-diagnosis with the health app is easier and cheaper than a trip to the clinic. We're urged to be our own health advocates and seek second opinions anyway, so why not ask Alexa or take advice from a celebrity? And you may not be inclined to give up your physician, but what if artificial intelligence could give you a more accurate diagnosis? Could AI replace your MD? It's Skeptic Check, Heal Thyself. Don't get us wrong, we know you like your doctor, but we also know it's easier to get cheap tickets to see Hamilton on Broadway than an appointment with a medical specialist when things aren't urgent. And if you live in an urban paradise, like I do, traffic between home and the clinic provides every incentive to stay put. Alexa, what's the traffic like on Highway 101? Traffic on your commute looks a bit slow. The fastest route takes about 1 hour 17 minutes via US 101 and CA 84. My point exactly. So why not stay home and consult with your virtual assistant about your symptoms? You know it's a great listener. You don't have to put on a drafty gown or limit your discussion to 10 minutes. Alexa is the most popular virtual assistant. In the 20 million homes where she's omnipresent and all ears, and uh, listening to you right now, she's keeping track of grocery lists, calling an Uber for you, and playing lullabies to the kids at night. She's reliable and seems like an ideal choice to turn to with questions about health. Catherine Foley is a science and health reporter at Quartz. In the July 2018 issue of the magazine, she and her co-worker, Yo-Yo Joe, looked into the reliability of the health advice provided by Alexa. When my coworker Yo-Yo Joe and I started this project, we were really interested in looking at how personal voice assistants at home were going to be changing the way that we try to diagnose ourselves at home. They wanted to know where Alexa got her information and what a doctor would make of it. There are two ways that Alexa can dispense medical and health information. First, you can ask Alexa using just her name, saying, Alexa, why is my throat sore, or something like that. According to Mayo Clinic, most sore throats are caused by viruses that cause the common cold and flu, viruses that cause mononucleosis, measles, chicken pox, and croup also can cause a sore throat. Less often, infections with bacteria can Alexa cause has throat. a set of answers that she can pull from from a set of sources like WebMD, Answers.com, Stats.com, or IMBD. And presumably these are what she uses for any time you ask her any kind of question. You would think that she is using WebMD for health-related questions, but Amazon would not confirm that that was necessarily the case. The second thing that you can do is use a skill, which is basically like an app, but for your voice assistant at home. There are approximately a thousand health-related apps or skills provided by Amazon. Examples include skills called Healthcare Genius or Virtual Nurse. Let's get started. I'm Virtual Nurse. I can provide you with information about illnesses, medications, and first aid. This app is for informational and educational purposes only. And in that case, you can say, Alexa, ask virtual nurse why my throat is sore. And she would give you a response from virtual nurse's responses, which might be different sources that you may or may not be able to see at the time that you're using this skill. So does Alexa have a good bedside manner and, more importantly, reliable, useful health advice? Well, let's find out. Okay, Catherine, let's say I don't know if I have the flu or a cold and I ask Alexa about it, what do I get in response? 
Typically, what Alexa does is pick up on different keywords and then give you information about those keywords. So if you said cold, she might give you information about a respiratory infection. If you said flu, she might talk about the stomach flu. She might talk about the regular flu or or bird flu or something like that. So do I understand this correctly, Catherine, that uh, her answer to my question, I'm I'm worried that I might have the flu or a cold or, or something else, is that she's going to give me a a kind of Wikipedia entry on flu and cold? I mean, just, you know, a description of of the words that I've used? That was the case most of the time, and that may or may not be helpful. But as one of our reviewing physicians when we tested these skills told us, oftentimes Wikipedia can be wrong. Isn't it possible that she would ask me questions simply to narrow the focus of her diagnosis? Alexa on her own isn't capable of doing that, although there are some health skills that we tested that would engage in a conversation with you similar to what you might experience at the doctor. Skills for Alexa work like apps for your smartphone. Anyone can develop a skill, and there are some skills related to health that are created by credible sources, like the Mayo Clinic or Boston Children's Hospital. There are some other skills that have more dubious sources, so we found some, like, first just labeled first aid or Zana health. And these might have really great doctor backed answers, but it's difficult to find where they get their information from. However, what we noticed with some of these is that they would go on and on for long conversations that meandered down some questions that don't seem to have anything to do with what you're asking about. So, for example, we asked the giant skill why is my throat sore? And it gave us uh, some 25 questions, which included personal information uh, regarding HIV status or, or past medical history and gender and age and location, which don't seem to be particularly relevant for figuring out whether or not you have the flu. We spoke to some physicians about this, and they were actually the most concerned about this line of questioning because it seems intelligent. It seems like what you might encounter at your doctor's office. But in reality, when you go visit your doctor, she will ask you more open-ended questions because questions aren't supposed to have specific answers. That might lead you to describe your symptoms differently than they really are, which could lead to a misdiagnosis. All right. So if Alexa tells me something about a cold and that sounds to me like it fits rather than the flu, I mean, that could save me, a, I don't know, maybe it'd save me a trip to the doctor. I don't know if I'd go to the doctor even with the flu, but potentially. And a very large percentage of the population is already using the web for medical device, you know, just, if you will, Googling in uh, some, something. So what's wrong with a visit to Dr. Alexa? Well, when you're looking up your symptoms online, although you should always, you know, verify whatever conclusion you come to with an actual physician, when you're looking online, you can see all of the different sources and make a decision for yourself, which one you would like to trust or which one you might want to ignore. When you're using your home voice assistant, it may or may not tell you where it's getting that information. And if it's getting its information from a more dubious source or, or someone that you don't know, you shouldn't trust that. As part of your study, Catherine, you and your colleagues asked Alexa a number of questions, printed off the answers, and shared them with medical professionals, i.e. doctors. What was their response? Neither of them were particularly impressed. In some cases, the answers were very bad or the question wasn't answered at all. And in other cases, they were really general, uh, so giving advice that might be okay for everyone. But as one of our physicians pointed out, there are certain people who shouldn't take certain advice, like taking ibuprofen or acetaminophen based on their medical histories. Often these patients will know who they are and understand that about their medical history. But if you think of, I don't know, a, a child or an elderly parent who lives in that home, maybe they've forgotten. The other thing that they noticed is often these skills would just pick up on keywords rather than actually answering the question. And often it was such a useless response, you would probably go Google it anyway. Is there any evidence that people are not only doing this, that is to say, turning to Alexa for medical advice, but uh, taking her medical advice seriously? 
So that's a much harder question to answer, and we don't have concrete data on that for now. However, if you look at some of the comments on these skills, they do imply that people are using them and either think they are helpful or fairly boring. You can also get an idea of how popular these skills are by just looking at their sheer numbers. So when we were conducting this study, I think by the end of April, there were over 900 skills related to health and fitness. Not all of them were diagnostic. Some of them were calorie counters or fitness trackers or what have you. But the fact that anyone can develop them means that lots of people are because they want to be featured on Amazon Skill Store. And there are no privacy laws protecting a medical conversation with Alexa. And for that matter, what about hackers? Exactly. At the moment, these devices are not HIPAA compliant because there is no HIPAA compliancy laws for uh, Amazon Web Services. However, per Amazon, these devices have a security system that makes them that is basically equivalent to being HIPAA compliant, but it's still important to note that it's not technically there yet. It remains to be seen whether Amazon is pursuing HIPAA compliancy with some of these devices. They might be. It would be an interesting investment, but they would not comment on the issue. All right. So, uh, Catherine, well, maybe I should call you Alexa for this question. (laughs) What's your advice to people who uh, will inevitably be tempted to ask their personal digital assistant uh, some questions about their health? What would you say before they did that? I think with anything that you're looking up about your your personal health, whether it be on your phone or your computer or using your voice assistant, it's really important to be skeptical of the sourcing and to have reliable sources bookmarked, talk to your doctor about them to know what information you should trust and which information you can disregard. Catherine Foley, thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Catherine Foley is a science and health reporter at Quartz. A link to her article, Alexa is a Terrible Doctor, is on our website, bigpicturescience.org. Well, it sounds like, as it is with all things Internet-related, not everything is accurate or reliable, and we have to remember that virtual assistants are relying on the Internet. Well, that's right. So the ultimate source of the information is no better than what you'd find if you just went around and tried to Google your problems. Obviously, you have to be cautious. It's patient beware on the Internet, I'd say. So patient beware, indeed, Even though you you don't feel like getting out of bed and going to see a doctor, perhaps call your physician on the phone. That might be that might be better than just relying on the virtual assistant, although the Internet can be helpful in some situations. Yeah. Well, obviously, turning to a virtual assistant for a diagnosis. I mean, that that's so convenient. It's so easy. It requires so little effort that I think that people would be very tempted to do it. It's just that, uh, you know, you're going to get what you paid for there, I think. Well, turning to a virtual assistant for diagnosis is one example of the trend of looking for health advice outside the medical clinic. And here's another, forgoing the clinic's neutral beige carpet for a red carpet. Coming up, when your health tips come from someone with an Academy Award instead of a medical degree. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science. Skeptic check, heal thyself. So it's the end of the year, and your mail is undoubtedly fully stuffed with solicitations for support. I hear you. Just yesterday, I got a thick envelope from the Society for Promoting the Proliferation of Freshwater Otters. It included a membership card, a four-color brochure, and a genuine nickel. Well, here at Big Picture Science, we won't send any of those things. We use your donation strictly for producing the program. Our operation is as lean as an Olympic marathon runner, so you can be sure that every dollar you send our way is converted directly to programming. So please, while this spot is playing in your brain, mouse over to the Big Picture Science website, that's bigpicturescience.org, and help out. If we were into puns, we'd suggest that you really ought to do it. Bigpicturescience.org. Alexa is not the only compelling public personality giving us health guidance. 
Hey, how's it going? Oh, your eye looks painful. Oh, it's watery and itchy. I think it's pink eye. I'm not sure what to do. Oh, just Google what Steve Carell did. What? You know, the actor Steve Carell. I read he got pink eye while filming Get Smart. Besides, he was in that film with Dwayne Johnson, who was in Southland Tale with Nora Dunn, who was in Working Girl with Harrison Ford, who played an actual doctor in The Fugitive. So you totally have the doctor thing covered. Uh, oh, okay. But you don't even need it, because Steve Carell is brilliant. I mean, he was up for an Oscar. Some celebrities actively dish out health advice. Actress Gwyneth Paltrow's company Goop is among the most popular and lucrative Pez-like dispensers of wellness tips. Launched a decade ago as an email newsletter, Goop has morphed into a website and a $250 million company that sells products. It joins other platforms glowing with celebrity wattage, such as that espoused by model, actress, and anti-vaccine activist Jenny McCarthy. But here's the thing. Since we're urged to be our own health advocates and to seek second opinions, why not outsource to Hollywood? Why not follow the advice of the photogenic? I mean, pearly smiles, million-dollar mansions. Things seem to be working out for them. Paul Offit is a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. His wry response is in the title of his latest book, Bad advice or why celebrities, politicians, and activists aren't your best source of health information. However, he does explain why we're tempted to follow them. Paul, I'd like to begin by simply asking you the very question that's posed by the subtitle of your book. Why would celebrities or politicians or activists be anyone's best source of health information? Well, I think in part because we think we know them. Uh, You know, celebrities are people that we see on the big screen or little screen. The same thing's true of politicians. And I think at some level, because they've been given a platform, they have influence. I mean, you you look at who is used to sell products, invariably it's celebrities because people think that they know them. I mean, they don't pick experts on that particular product to sell them. They pick celebrities. All right. So we feel that we know them and consequently we should listen to them. It's sort of like your next door neighbor. I mean, if they were telling you, you know, something that might be relevant to your health, would you listen to them if they, you know, they weren't actually medical doctors? Yes, that's exactly who people do listen to because they trust them. Whereas the the doctor or the clinician is seen as somebody a little more distant, more uh, formal, part of the medical industrial complex. And so people are a little more turned off by them. And especially these days, you know, if you go to a doctor's office, the doctor sits there, stares at the computer screen, types in your information, often doesn't look at you. It's distancing, whereas your neighbor's your friend. They're going to give you information that helps you, well, even if it doesn't. Well, now, let, let's follow up a little bit on that, because Gwyneth Paltrow, she was written up in the New York Times, actually. It was a big, big story about her company, Goop. Uh, that started out as a website for health and lifestyle advice, And then it has grown into a multi-billion dollar company. It's gotten a lot of criticism for making health and wellness claims that are not supported by science. And that seems to have only increased the business. What is it about Gwyneth Paltrow giving me health advice? Yeah, I'm not so sure it's her specifically as as much as what she's offering. She's offering magic. She's offering these wonderful magical cures. If you have an autoimmune disorder for which medicine offers little or appears to offer little, she has magic glasses or, you know, magic rubs that can make you better. I mean, this is not new. I think for centuries we've been very much drawn in by snake oil salesmen. She's just a modern day snake oil salesman. Well, give an example of bad health advice and possibly also an example of it being consequential. She argues that if you want to bounce your uterine hormones, then what you should do is you should have vaginal steaming with mugwort. Um, Vaginal steaming is not a good idea. It can cause burns and serious infections, uh, aside from the fact that it's never going to get into your uterus, and mugwort isn't a hormone. It's terrible advice. And, and in addition, she recently, or not so recently, has talked about jade eggs, that one inserts that into the vagina in order to induce a better muscle tone. But if you have foreign bodies sitting in your vagina for lengthy periods of time, you can have bacterial overgrowth, especially with bacteria that cause so-called toxic shock syndrome. That's what happened with those superabsorbent tampons a couple decades ago when we had an outbreaks of a toxic shock syndrome because of that recommendation. But in the New York Times Magazine piece, it said that Gwyneth Paltrow has given in to pressure and says the company will hire a fact checker. 
Um, so, you know, her claims about, I don't know, magically charged stones and, and maybe these uh, vaginal steaming routines, maybe they will be dropped from the website. Do you have any uh, optimistic uh, thoughts about this? No. I think what will happen is is that you'll probably see vaguer statements. In other words, that FDA can actually crack down on you if you make a specific medical recommendation. So, for example, if you say concentrated garlic is going to lower your bad cholesterol, so-called low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, then the FDA can crack down on you. If you make a vaguer claim, you know, like supports heart health, supports joint health, boosts immunity, then it's a little harder to crack down. I guess I think they're just going to get vaguer, would be my guess. Now, obviously, Paltrow is simply an example of a more general phenomenon. We listen to celebrities and non-experts. As you say, they're selling snake oil, yes, perhaps, but they're also addressing things that people may not be able to get much better advice on. A lot of your book describes the vaccine controversy, that, that vaccinations have caused autism, and that's, that's a field that you specialize in. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about the backstory on that. Well, so the fact of the matter is, is that modern medicine doesn't really know what does cause autism. And so when parents of children who have this disorder, which is certainly emotionally and financially burdensome, you know, they want answers and medicine really doesn't have answers or cures. So this is where often you'll see sort of, quote unquote, alternative healers step in. They'll know what the cause is. So let's say they, they say that vaccines cause it or they know what cures are, you know, casein free diets, gluten free diets. And that's all very seductive for parents who are desperate to do something, anything to help their child. And I, this is the worst kind of quackery to me or, or people who take advantage of parents desperate uh, desire to help their child. But I think it's because there are um, limits to modern medicine, and that's often where you see uh, groups like this step in. The whole autism story that uh, vaccination causes autism, that was actually started by a legitimate medical researcher, right? I mean, it, this appeared in a referee journal. I mean, wh what happened there? G give me that story just briefly. Right. So it was a, it was a British uh, gastroenterological surgeon, a GI surgeon uh, named Andrew Wakefield, who in 1998 published a paper in the British medical journal called The Lancet, which is, you know, one of the best of the general medical journals, claiming that the combination of measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccine caused autism, for which he had virtually no evidence. Or said another way, he had no evidence. What he did was he had a case series, which is to say eight children who had, within the previous month, received an MMR vaccine that had then developed signs and symptoms of autism. That's not exactly a proof. He might as well have published a study of eight children who had leukemia that within the previous month had eaten peanut butter sandwiches and, and claimed that that was the cause because that was about how rigorous his proof was of causality. There are now 17 studies done in seven countries on three different continents involving hundreds of thousands of children showing that there is no relationship between receiving that vaccine and developing autism. So it didn't stand. But the fact of the matter is it's hard to unring the bell. It's hard to unscare people once you've scared them, and that's where we are now. There's still plenty of people who believe this, and there are still celebrities who endorse this point of view that uh, getting your kid vaccinated particularly given the number of vaccinations that uh, babies undergo, uh, is a, a bad idea and that's still causing people not to get their kids vaccinated. I mean, it's still, it's still happening despite the fact that this was disproved. Right. So people like Kristen Cavallari, who's married to Jay Cutler, who's, you know, the quarterback, was the quarterback for the Bears, I think now he's with the, the Dolphins, and people like Jenny McCarthy or Jim Carrey or Rob Schneider, all of those have sort of stood up, uh, I think, in their minds, in defense of children by saying, look, don't get vaccinated because you put yourself at this risk. In fact, they're doing exactly the opposite. What they're doing is they're hurting children by making a recommendation that can only cause parents to make a bad decision that puts their child at unnecessary risk. It's the opposite of what they think they're doing. Isn't it similar in, when it comes to cancer? There are people who say, if you only change your diet, we can cure this cancer or that? Absolutely. So, so for example, glioblastoma multiforme, brainstem gliomas, and adenocarcinomas of the, of the pancreas. Uh, probably the best example is somebody like Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs, interestingly, although he had pancreatic cancer, he had a neuroendocrine tumor of his pancreas. That wasn't the kind that typically kills you. If he had gotten early surgery, he would have had likely a 95% chance of survival, but he didn't. Instead, what he did was he chose an alternative course. He chose things like coffee enemas and fruit juices and acupuncture, which only delayed a surgery that could have saved his life, and then it was too late. Uh, have you considered the effects of uh, YouTube on the public? Because some of what seem to be the most pernicious bits of health advice can be 
put out there by anyone with access to the Internet. Years ago, one of, uh, one of my friends said she was encouraged by the YouTube video that said that sodium bicarbonate could cure her cancer. Sodium bicarbonate, baking, baking soda. Luckily, she went to a doctor instead, and she's, she's okay now. But the point is that there's a lot of unscientific health advice on YouTube, and YouTube is so easily accessed and so compelling because it's video. Just like the internet in general, it works both ways. I mean, there there's some excellent stuff on YouTube. Z Dog MD is is this guy in Las Vegas who does great YouTube videos about uh, health and and science, and does it in a very comedic way. And there there are I know that a lot of the people that work to try and get good vaccine information out there also use YouTube to get that information out there. But you're right, it works both ways, and the the viewer or listener is trying to confront which to believe, and it's hard. I think without a scientific or medical background, it's hard to know who to believe. Paul, you write that polls show that most people still trust the word of scientists, uh, you know, a majority, 70, 80 percent. So let's say that maybe 30 percent of the population would prefer to take the word of amateurs over that of medical doctors and that that percentage doesn't change very much. If the majority, though, of the population does trust scientists, why bother to try and convince the rest? Because maybe that's tilting at windmills. Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I certainly think that when polled, people will say that they trust scientists who tell them about science. The problem is, I think that scientists don't do a lot of talking uh, for a number of reasons. I think one is because there's limited access. I think the quote was something like uh, about one of every 300 minutes on CNN is actually devoted in any sense to science and technology. And the Boston Globe, for example, which is located in the heart of the biotech industry, has you know basically eliminated its science and technology section in support of instead sort of health and wellness. It's hard to get your voice out there, number one. Number two is I think scientists certainly aren't trained in, in sort of dealing with uh, the media or with the public, and they're assuming other people are doing it, and they're reticent to do it. So we aren't doing the talking. We're, we're letting other people do the talking, which I think hurts our ability to get our message out there. Paul Offit, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Paul Offit is a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of Bad Advice or Why Celebrities, Politicians, and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information. Since we recorded our interview with Dr. Offit, there have been developments regarding Gwyneth Paltrow's company, Goop. It has agreed to pay $145,000 in a California settlement for making false claims about the health benefits of the vaginal eggs and other products. While celebrities are more reliable as actors playing doctors than as real-life experts proffering prescriptions, Dr. Offit admits that there are limits to the answers that modern medicine can provide, and that makes it tempting to shrug off conclusions of medical science because they are incomplete or inconvenient. But an example of the high price of medical science denialism came in the 1980s during the early days of the AIDS crisis. This is when researchers were first drawing the causal link between HIV and AIDS. The gap of uncertainty was closing, but it was still wide enough to allow for doubt. And into that space, a California researcher inserted an alternative hypothesis. HIV did not, in fact, cause AIDS. The idea gained traction because of the natural resistance to the reality of the AIDS epidemic, and it went global. Richard Marlink, director of the Rutgers Global Health Institute, has overseen the coordination of AIDS research and training programs in developing countries for 30 years. He says the misinformation about how AIDS is transmitted eventually caught the attention of the president of South Africa. We spoke with Dr. Marlink at the New York Academy of Sciences, where he presented the opening remarks for a panel discussion about science denialism and global health. In the 80s, there was a movement that got started once we identified the virus uh, and then started trying to figure out, is this the virus that really is causing AIDS? But certain scientists had alternative theories and said, you know, let's think about that. It may just be a carrier virus. It may be something that's happening because people have lowered immune systems for other reasons. Now, those are valid theories, but they became dogma for certain scientists. And that changed people's minds that weren't scientists and with the help of the internet actually uh, changed the mind of the president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. Let me uh, follow up on that. So the gentleman that you're speaking of is the University of California Berkeley virologist Peter Duesberg, and he denied that HIV caused AIDS, and this was 30 years ago, so this was in the 80s. Um, 
Before we get to the consequences of his denialism, didn't the scientific establishment say that he had a right to dissent? He had a right to present yeah. a alternative opinion to what the majority of scientists were saying about the relationship between HIV and AIDS. Yes, at the beginning, it was an alternate hypothesis or one of the ideas, let's don't jump to conclusions until we have proof. Science is about testing your hypotheses. But he took it a step further and made it dogma and actually attacked people who would question his hypothesis. So it became something that was beyond science. It was an opinion that was unshakable for him. And then he began to mobilize other people that were many non-scientists to be part of the movement that HIV does not cause AIDS, and if you try to treat HIV with the drugs, you're only going to have toxicities and problems. So the drugs are not going to be something that we need to look into. So it went beyond science and became something using science to try to make a personal point, a vendetta almost, that he had. And you pointed out that the president of South Africa, Mbeki, seized upon these ideas that HIV did not cause AIDS, and these were ideas that he got off the internet. Well, President Mbeki admitted himself that he found Peter Duisberg's ideas on the internet, and he even invited him to show in a scientific conference that, you know, this should be questioned whether HIV causes AIDS, and these drugs now that were already by that time proven to be very effective, these drugs should be questioned. And I think it was more, it probably played into President Becky's own view of the world and his own potential mistrust of the West. Can't blame him for that, coming out of apartheid and an African leader. But whatever the case was, his decision, President Becky's decision to block having antiretroviral or anti-AIDS drugs come into his country for five years caused the premature death of literally hundreds of thousands of people of South Africans living with HIV that didn't have access to drugs that were being provided for free by the United States actually and uh, in other African countries surrounding South Africa were being provided. So whether he, President Becky was using Duisberg's theories just to promote his own or to align with his own worldview. I can't say, but he was affected in his own words by Duisberg and saying, look, a Western scientist here is saying that HIV does not cause AIDS and we should not believe in these drugs. I wonder if I could prompt you to tell the story of the of the woman that you spoke with who um, did not believe that HIV caused AIDS and so she would not have her child treated. Yeah, Christine uh, Majahori, she also fell under the spell of Peter Duisberg. And, and to be clear, she was in the United States at the time. Right, right. She's um, HIV positive, living with AIDS, and she was part of the AIDS denialist that HIV did not cause AIDS and that the drugs would be toxic compared to not taking them. So she refused to take the drugs that would have prevented her daughter, um, she was pregnant at the time, would have prevented her daughter from becoming HIV infected. So her daughter was born, unfortunately got HIV infected. Um, then she refused to have her daughter treated. With At the time, there was effective treatment. So uh, her daughter died of AIDS, and Christine died of AIDS after that. Well, I'm wondering, this is not the first person who has denied the causal relationship, and I'm wondering why her story stands out to you. Because she became an activist on the topic, um, not just I'm not going to do this for my own body and my daughter's situation, but became a vocal activist. She had her own website and other things that uh, actively tried to make other people be part of that belief system. So something else psychologically drives people to actively say, this is going to be what I'm going to stand for and try to convert other people to my belief system. You've used the term worldview um, a couple times now in terms of framing the belief system of, in this case, Professor Duisberg, but other people who are science denialists. And wh what is the role of a, of a worldview or a belief system in deciding whether or not you're going to accept the facts of science? We all have our own worldviews. I'm speaking more 
psychologically or sociologically, not uh, that it's a world campaign or something. We have our own worldviews of how the world works and what's good and bad and how the world should be or how we hope it will be. That's what I mean by worldviews. And secondly, we have our own areas of what we think are important. All of us have our own different opinions. And, and third, we have our own experience, and we also uh, the experience of those people that we trust. So some combination of those three end up making us have decisions about what we trust and believe in. So we might believe in most things that have been scientifically proven, but in certain areas we say, well, we're not so sure because our worldview of mistrust of government or mistrust of uh, big business, uh, we say, well, we're not so sure of this. Finally, the stories that you're telling about the science denialism around the link between HIV and AIDS began 30 years ago, and couldn't one say, well, well, that's old news? And I'm wondering what that particular story of science denialism has to do with the science denialism we're seeing today. Well, I guess the HIV causing AIDS denialism started almost exactly 30 years ago with Peter Duisberg. I guess what it has to do today is that it should teach us that all of us have our own belief systems. And we have a right to those belief systems. It's part of human nature. They're governed, as we said, by our worldview, by our own view of what we think is important, and by our past experiences. But when it affects other people and harms other people, then it's not right. The same thing's happening for climate change. The same thing happens with vaccines, is when it's taken on for other reasons as a cause to prove some other point of view, then it can be dangerous. Richard Marlink, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you so much, Molly. Richard Marlink is the director of the Rutgers Global Health Institute. As a coda, we note that in 2008, researchers at Harvard University reported that South Africa's misguided AIDS policies begun in the 1990s and the attendant withholding of life-saving drugs caused the deaths of more than 300,000 South Africans between the years 2000 and 2005. Clearly, ignoring the expertise of doctors and scientists can have tragic consequences, but are there cases where we might turn to another kind of expertise? What happens when artificial intelligence dons the stethoscope? It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science. Skeptic check, heal thyself. Imagine going to the doctor's office and hearing, Dr. Robbie Robot, we'll see you now, and then walking into the examination room to be greeted by a hydraulic android with a fishbowl head. I am to transport you to the residence. For your convenience, I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. I mean, that would be weird. And that's not what we mean when we say that computers and artificial intelligence will replace doctors one day. I, I mean, at least we're pretty sure that's not what we mean. Computers have been shown to be more accurate than human doctors in diagnosing some cancers and other maladies. And research fellow Shinjini Kundu at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is developing artificial intelligence to detect some diseases three years before they would be noticeable to a physician. In other words, AI might see things that your doctor can't. Dr. Kundu begins her talks on this subject with what is a common comparison in presentations about AI, chihuahua or muffin. The idea really is that there are tasks that humans find second nature. For example, differentiating a chihuahua and a muffin. But AI systems can sometimes have difficulty with tasks like this. But what about when it comes to something that humans can't differentiate? You know, right now, we're able to diagnose a lot of diseases, and we have fairly good treatments for them. But I think the next frontier in medicine really is how do we detect diseases before they develop? How do we detect the diseases before there are gross changes in the human body that 
are so obvious that even humans can't miss them. So when diseases develop in the body, there are often subtle changes, and medical imaging is the way that we can look inside of the body without lifting a scalpel. Can you perhaps give me an example of the kind of uh, images where you would rather have AI eyeballs on the images than uh, those of, uh, you know, somebody at a clinic who, who would read an MRI scan or an X-ray or something like that? Sure. So today there are some statistics that up to 80% of medical diagnoses are made or confirmed through imaging studies. And the example that I've talked about in the past is with osteoarthritis detection. So there are images of knee cartilage where you show the image to a lay person. You can't tell what the difference is between somebody who's going to develop osteoarthritis in three years of pain versus someone who's not. And if you show the image to a radiologist or someone who's trained to look at the images, they also wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So the challenge is that if there are subtle patterns there that lie beneath human detection, can an AI system find it? So have you done that? I mean, have you, have you fed an AI machine a whole bunch of photos of uh, people's knees and then, you know, seen whether it can tell you three years in advance whether somebody's going to get osteoarthritis? Yes, exactly. So I developed a new technology. Um, it's called 3D transport-based morphometry, but that's kind of a mouthful, so I call it TBM, affectionately. And basically what TBM does is that if you feed it a lot of images of knee cartilage, and let's say you already ha you've already tracked these patients over time, so you have the benefit of knowing who will actually go on to develop arthritis, it can learn what that common pattern is. And what we found is that not only does it find a very specific pattern that's common to those who go on to develop osteoarthritis, but that pattern is actually so sensitive that it can indicate in a new person that the system has never seen before and predict whether that person will go on to develop osteoarthritis in three years. It can do this with up to 86% accuracy, but of course there's always room for improvement as we add more scans and more data for the AI to learn off of. Well, Shinjini, what about other diseases? I mean, obviously, you said 86% success rate in predicting osteoarthritis three years in advance. Uh, what about, for example, breast cancer? Because a mammogram, I mean, it's a very complicated image, and not all the tiny lumps in there are dangerous. Could AI help in catching cancer earlier? I think those are some very exciting future applications of this technology. So the thing that I'm most excited about is if I can find a hidden pattern from these medical images that humans hadn't been able to see for early detection of osteoarthritis, then maybe there are hidden patterns that exist like this in a lot of different diseases. And being able to find these patterns may help us detect and diagnose disease at stages that we can't currently do today. And the next step is if we understand what is going on at these stages of disease. So for example, in osteoarthritis, three years before symptoms develop, if you can actually see what the changes are. Doctors can design new interventions and maybe have the chance to stave off diseases before they develop. Well, I assume that that effort is going on, and I also assume that as computers get faster and less expensive, that this will be applied more and more. So I gotta ask you, Shinjini, do you think that AI will ever supplant, even replace a doctor's diagnosis for, for a whole bunch of diseases? I mean, it's already the case that they're pretty good at recognizing diseases that, for example, a doctor might never have seen because they're fairly rare. I think this kind of goes back to the chihuahua and the muffin problem. Um, and I think this is really where it's relevant because a doctor making a diagnosis, it's a complicated process. It's an art. It really is more akin to recognizing the difference between a chihuahua and a muffin than it is, say, like crunching numbers on a calculator. It actually is, there's part art and there's also part science. And so I think that while AI can help push the limits of that science aspect, the art aspect is, is something that humans do really well and they can continue to bring that to the table. Whereas AI can search through almost you know, seemingly infinite space of patterns or possibilities to interpret 
large data sets in ways that humans can't do. It can help sort of triage patients. And one of the benefits is that it, it can help point people who might need medical attention the most towards doctors, and that might help in sort of efficient allocation of resources in that regard. But you know, in terms of making diagnoses, I sometimes also worry about how would AI perform in the presence of incomplete information. I think that that's still something we have to explore in applications like that. Shinjini Kundu, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Well, thank you for having me. Shinjini Kundu is a research fellow at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Well, clearly, it's already the case that artificial intelligence has the edge when it comes to certain kinds of diagnosis. Now, this is kind of making me nervous because I like my doctor. I got to make sure he's still going to be there for me. Hi, this is Dr. Schlisserman. Uh, Dr. Schlisserman? Yes, hi, Seth. Hi, this is uh, your patient, Seth, of course. Hey, listen, uh, we've been looking into the question of artificial intelligence uh, being used for diagnosis, and uh, it might be better than doctors. What do you think of that? Well, I think there are certain algorithms that artificial intelligence can probably go through and help aid physicians in making diagnoses, but I certainly don't think it would be a, uh, in any way a replacement for the human factor that physicians bring to the relationship. Can I ask you, you know, when a patient walks into your office, you've seen them before, you've, you've seen them for years in most cases. Do you notice things that uh, maybe the artificial intelligence uh, setup might not notice? Oh, I think that is a major difference, that there's so much more that goes into diagnosing a patient than just going through an algorithm. There is the look and the sense you get, the touch, that is extremely helpful when it comes to diagnosing and treating a patient. Well, finally, Dr. Schlissman, are you concerned that, uh, you know, these devices might pose a threat to your job and you might be forced into, I don't know, uh, unintentional retirement? No, I don't think so. For the reasons I mentioned, I certainly don't think physicians would be uh, supplanted by, you know, artificial intelligence. I would tell you if someone could come up with some robot, whether it had feet or not, I would kiss them if they could come up with algorithms that could get me out of doing prior authorizations and calling into insurance companies. In other words, you'd be gratified if they could uh, do the paperwork and leave the diagnosis to you. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) All right. Dr. Schlissman, thanks so much for talking with me. Anytime, Seth. Take care. So what we're hearing in the show is that there are many sources of medical information out there that you could turn to instead of turning to your doctor, but that doesn't mean that you should or just accept those diagnoses without some critical thought as to where they're coming from. So clearly, you've got to be a little careful. We're talking about your health. We're not talking about, you know, whether your windows are clean or whether your car works. So you've got to consider the source of the advice you're getting. If it's somebody on television, they don't know you. They don't have the, the, the background in terms of your health for the past 20 years. They just don't have any of that stuff. And beyond that, they might or might not be qualified. But there is a reason why we're attracted to those television and movie personalities. As Paul Offit says, we identify with them, even though we're not celebrities, or we just like them. They offer alternative solutions that medical science can't provide. Well, obviously, if you have a really serious medical problem, you know, you might not want to hear what your doctor says, particularly if your doctor comes back and says, we don't know what causes this, and I don't know how to treat it. And there's somebody over here coming in on the Internet or on the television or whatever and says, you know, I do know how to deal with this. Then, of course, you're going to be tempted to listen to that. And we've heard that there are serious consequences of issuing medical advice just because it's inconvenient or it's incomplete. And a very stark example of that is what happened when AIDS denialism circulated in the late 80s and the 90s. I think another interesting thing in the show is where this is all going. Uh, clearly, artificial intelligence is coming into the picture, and uh, it's, it's better at doing some things. It can stop uh, the progression of some diseases by simply diagnosing them very much earlier. That's a great thing. 
And I can imagine that 20 years from now, you know, getting artificial intelligence involved in your health care uh, is going to be a no-brainer, as it were. Okay, but for now, we still have doctors. They are humans, and we should continue to appeal to their expertise. Thanks to those whose advice we never question in producing the show, Senior Producer Gary Niederhoff, Production Assistant Sarah Derwin, and Operations Manager Barbara Vance. We're also grateful for financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science. Skeptic check, heal thyself was this episode. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you'll also find links there to our guests. Oh, and if you never want to miss an episode, Subscribe to Bipi Sci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. Why did the banana go to the doctor? Because he wasn't peeling well. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.